Bibles, if you would please, to Genesis chapter 28, uh, verses 10 through 22. Genesis uh, 28, verses 10 through 22. And while you're turning there, it really is amazing that even though in some ways through our sin and shortcomings and in Genesis the fall where creation fell because of man's sin, we are kind of like mongrels, aren't we? But God adopts us into his family and we're his, um, we're his crowning jewel. You know, they say the most valuable thing on, in the universe is the blood of Jesus Christ. But you know, even more valuable than the blood of Jesus Christ are you and me. Because God gave his blood. For you and for me. You are, the, you, are the, you are the apex of God's creation. You're the crown jewel of His creation. And even though we sinned and fell through Jesus, He readopts us again into the family of God. Well, Genesis tells us all about that. We've talked about the creation and we've talked about the fall. And tonight during the Amazing Collection at 4 o'clock, we'll be walking out by 5. So some of you who can't drive after dark, you'll still be able to make it home. We've learned all about the creation and the fall. And um, there's one theme in Genesis, as this is my last sermon in Genesis. We're going to start in Exodus for two sermons, because in the Amazing Collection we're going to be studying uh, Exodus. But this is my last sermon in Genesis, and I'm going to talk to you about a subject that we should be very interested in. It's a recurring theme in the book of Genesis, and it has to do with a special location. In Genesis, turn in the Bible, if you would please, to Genesis 28, verses 10 through 22. And we're going to talk about a very important place in Genesis, a recurring place, a place where Abraham went to over and over again, a place where Jacob went back to over and over again. And the reason why it's very important to our church is the name of this place is Bethel. Bethel is a recurring place geographic place in the Bible. It's one of the most important places in the Bible. After the Garden of Eden, probably Bethel is the most important place in the book of Genesis because this is a place where all the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it's a place where all the patriarchs went to reconnect with God. And so somewhere down the line, somebody decided to name this church Bethel Baptist Church. And maybe they named it Bethel Baptist Church because Bethel is a name in the Bible. Or maybe they knew that this is a place, Bethel in, in Genesis is a place where you can come to meet God. Where you can come to wrestle with God. Where you can come to reconnect with the Lord. And so there's many, many places in Genesis that could have been our launching point for a message about Bethel. But I decided to start here in Genesis 28. But before this chapter, Bethel occurs. After this chapter, Bethel occurs. This is um, a very important place uh, in, in the Bible and especially in the book of Genesis. And in the rest of our time together, I'm going to tell you why. And then I'm going to translate that into today's world and some of the same features of the Bethel of the Old Testament we need to have as a church, Bethel Baptist Church today. Uh, let's stand together one more time as we read God's Word. Um, some of you, um, when you sit too long, uh, you get like the tin man, and I have to put oil in your joints. And so, But we can't stand up too long, but let's stand up one more time as I read these verses. And we're going to be looking at the subject of back to Bethel. Because over and over again in the Bible, the Bible says they went back to Bethel. So here we go. Starting with verse 10, And Jacob went out from Beersheba, and went toward, towards Haran. And he came upon a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun was set. And he took the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and laid down in that place to sleep. Hey, um, Spencer, how would you like to have a stone for a pillow? You know, if you've ever slept outside, you know, a stone is better than nothing because, you know, your head needs to elevate a little bit. So he used a stone uh, for a pillow and he lays down to sleep. Now catch this. He dreams a dream. In verse 12, And behold, a ladder set up on earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on this ladder. Kind of reminds me of an escalator, doesn't it? Where you see this stairway to heaven, great Led Zeppelin song, stairway to heaven, that, uh, that, um, that, uh, that Jacob dreams, and he sees these angels going up and down into heaven and back. Verse 13, And behold, the Lord stood above it, stood above this ladder, and said, I am the Lord, God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereupon you lie, I give to you and all your descendants. And your offspring shall be as the dust of the earth, 
And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you, all your descendants, and in all your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with you, and I will keep you in all places where you go, and I will bring you again into this land, for I will not leave you until I have done that which I have spoken to you about. And Jacob woke out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for a pillow and set it up as a pillar and he poured oil on the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city was called Luz at first. It was a Canaanite city called Luz. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And everything you give me, I will surely give a tenth back unto thee. I pray God's blessing upon the reading of his word. You may be seated. Back to Bethel. Now the name Bethel actually comes from two Hebrew words. Bet or bait meaning house and El meaning God. So Bethel literally means the house of God. And so this Canaanite city, Luz, when Jacob had this encounter with the Lord, he renamed it Bethel. Surely this is the house of God. Numerous events in, the, in, the, in Bible history occurred here, uh, including God's appearances to, to, uh, to uh, Abraham, to Jacob. Um, by the way, later on in the Bible, this became the place where the Ark of the Covenant was housed. Right. What better place to house the Ark of the Covenant than Bethel, the house of God? It was a special place. From Bethel emanated the promise to, of God to, to Abraham and Jacob that the land, as far as you can see, to the east, to the west, to the north, and the south, you know, this is going to be the land of Israel. This is right. going to be the land that I give to you. And so, in a sense, Bethel geographically is a center of Israel. Bethel spiritually is the center of Israel. And the Bible says through Israel, all nations of the world will be blessed. So Amen. Bethel, in a sense, is the epicenter of God's movement in the world. Right. Now listen, is this Bethel the epicenter of God's movement in the world? Yes, it is. <laughs> this is the epicenter. This is the headquarters. The local church is the headquarters from which emanates God's plan for the world. Amen. The world will be reached from Bethel. The state of Louisiana will be reached from Bethel. Our community will be transformed through Bethel. This is the ignition point of the flame of missions and revival that will be lit, that will spread throughout the world, and we will light that flame today, here on Sunday, at Bethel again this Sunday, and that flame will emanate through the lives of our believers, through our giving, and through our prayers. Right. This is the epicenter of what God is doing, the local church. So I love the name Bethel Baptist Church. All right, um, Bethel means the house of God. At a time, the Ark of the Covenants containing the Ten Commandments was housed here. It has a long connection to biblical events in the Bible. It's located north of Jerusalem. It's located um, west of the Jordan River. Now, Bethel, again, as I told you earlier, was not always a holy place. Bethel was originally a Canaanite city named Luz. And as you studied in the amazing collection in your book, uh, this week, you realize the Canaanites of all the cultures during that time, there were three major cultures. The Canaanites were what? They were the most sinful. And so isn't it amazing that the center, the epicenter of God's activity in the world used to be a godless Canaanite city. That speaks a lot about the redemptive power of God, doesn't it? Bethel is very significant in the Bible, especially in Genesis, you see Bethel occurring over and over and over again. First of all, when Abraham was called out of Ur, you remember when God said, go on a journey, I'm not even going to tell you where to go. And Abraham took his whole clan and he went across the Fertile Crescent from Ur at the mouth of the Euphrates and Tigris rivers, around through the Fertile Crescent, north of Israel into Lebanon, down following the Jordan River, the river Valley, when he finally got into the Promised Land, this is where Abraham, when he first entered Canaan, he camped between Bethel and Ai, Genesis 12 When he returned from Egypt, you remember he went down to Egypt and lied about Sarah? He said he was, Sarah was, was his sister. You know why he said Sarah was his sister? 
Because he was afraid Pharaoh would kill him if he found out that Sarah was his wife. Because Sarah was a babe. She was very beautiful. Hey, after she was 100 years old, there were people and kings that had their eye on Sarah. She was so beautiful. And so now he's coming back from Egypt. And he returns there to Bethel in Genesis 13 and calls on the name of the Lord. All right, Bethel. Jacob, when he's fleeing from Beersheba to Haran, had his stairway to heaven experience at Bethel. Um, years later, when he returns there, he built an, author, uh, an altar to God and he reissued that name. He renamed it Bethel and even, and even reinforced it. He, he didn't name it Bethel, the house of God. He renamed it El Bethel, which means God's house of God. I mean, so he's reissuing it and says, go, God's, this is God's house, but boy, God's really here in this house. So Bethel, house of God, El Bethel, the house of God. Of God. It was at that time that God gave Jacob a new name. You know what Jacob's new name was? Israel. Right. Jacob, the old deceiver, became Israel. One who prevails with God or one who triumphs with God. Some people say it means one who wrestles with God, which would definitely be a good name for Jacob as well. Because remember, he wrestled with God and got his thigh out of joint by wrestling with an angel or by wrestling with God. So uh, Bethel. It's significant in the Bible. And uh, that's pretty much my message, except what does this teach us in the 21st century today? We've learned a good Bible study about Bethel, its geography, and what happened in the past. What does that have to do with us today in the 21st century? Why would a church name itself Bethel, Baptist Church? What significance does that name have today? Well, here are a few things that this term Bethel has taught me. By the way, have you heard any sermons on Bethel? I bet at Bethel Baptist Church you've heard a lot of sermons on Bethel. But let me, let me tell you what this Bible study has taught me. Number one, kids, this Bible study teaches me about redemption. Right. Genesis 28, 19. You know what redemption means? It means to buy back, to restore, to make valuable again. You remember this city of Bethel or this area called Bethel used to be an old Canaanite city, Luz. The Canaanites were violent, godless, idolatrous people. And yet God chose this most violent place in the world to become the house of God. In fact, it was not far from the five <coughs> plain cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, if you remember that. Yeah. But even Luz, even that old Canaanite city was not too far gone to be redeemed and to be used by the Lord for a great purpose. Remember a couple of months ago I told you who remembered about SNH Green Stamps? That's the greatest example of redemption I've heard of in my life. SNH Green Stamps used to hand them out at the grocery stores and well my mom was a big SNH Green Stamp collector and you collected enough of those books of SNH Green Stamps you could get all kinds of bicycles and discounts off of other food and you know you get a, a coffee pot or a teapot and you know, all, all kinds of things you could get with those SNH Green Stamps. I remember at night licking those XNH green stamps, putting them into that book. My tongue turned green, licking the SNH green stamps. You collected about 30 or 40 of those books. You go to the Redemption Center. You remember that? The SNH green stamp Redemption Center. And you turn those books in, and you get valuable things in return. Now, those SNH green stamps have no value. In fact, it used to say on the stamp, no value. But yet, some reason, you put them in the right book, and you put them in the right configuration, and you take them to the right place, and all of a sudden, the redemption center takes something of no value and makes it of great value. Right. That's what God does in our life. He, he, he puts His stamp on us, yeah. and we go to the redemption center, the cross, and we who have very little or no value are made valuable again by the Lord Jesus Christ. Right, Bethel teaches me that it's all about redemption with God. That even a godless Canaanite city can become the epicenter of what God is doing in the world. Absolutely. Now, is our Bethel a redemptive place? Yes, sir. Is our Bethel? We've seen this church come back from the grave, from trials in the past. And we've seen people come back from the grave. People with no hope. People who were lost in their sins. People whose only direction was hell. But then their address changed after they accepted Christ from hell to heaven. And we've seen people now have families reclaimed, um, drug addictions broken through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this Bethel should show us that no matter how far gone, we can always come back 
if we give our lives to Christ. Yeah. Hey, preacher, you don't know what kind of sinner I am. Listen, folks, you don't know what kind of Savior he is. Right. You can, no matter how far gone you are, you can come back. And Bethel teaches me that it's a place of redemption. Bethel also in the Bible was a place of rest. You know, for some reason, even if they were even if they were running for their lives from a Jacob, from Esau, or a different place, they would go to they would go to Bethel, and somehow they could find rest at Bethel. Man, they slept better at Bethel. They dreamed better at Bethel. Even a rock, you know, was a, was a was a soft, downy pillow where they could sleep a deep sleep. When Abraham first entered Canaan, he camped between Bethel and Ai. And then Jacob had the greatest sleep of his life with a, with a stone uh, for a pillow at Bethel. Now, God is everywhere, okay? God is everywhere. And so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not real Catholic. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a Baptist. You know? you know, Catholics are real big on positions and having, doing things in the church or doing things a certain way. I, I'm not like, God's everywhere. You can meet God anywhere. You can be saved anywhere. But, but I've, got to, I've got to say something. There's something special about Bethel. Yeah. There's something special about Bethel. Now, God is everywhere, but there was something special about this place. Not because God isn't everywhere, but for some reason, God designated this place as a place where he would meet with his chosen children in a real and special way. I don't know. Perhaps it was a pleasant place. Perhaps it provided shelter and safety. Maybe there was a rock formation that gave people... More shelter and safety. We don't know. But what we do know is that it was a special place of rest. Right. Is our Bethel a place of rest? Is our Bethel a place where you can rest in the Lord? Now again, God is everywhere, folks. You can be saved anywhere. You can go home today and pray and receive Christ and be saved. You can watch TV and be saved. You can be out fishing and be saved. But I'll tell you, more people are saved in churches. Why? Because the Word of God is preached and invitation is issued Amen. and you've got friends and neighbors and family members praying for you and singing an invitation hymn. I don't know. There's something about this place, not that God isn't everywhere, but in this place, we have put the mechanisms together that make it, um, make it a, a, a place of nurture and care, a place where you can rest in the Lord. Right. This Amen. is a designated place of worship. You can worship God fishing on Sunday morning, but not as well as you can worship here. That's this right. is a special place where you can meet the Lord. You can worship with other believers. You can learn God's Word. You can experience corporate prayer. You can follow the Lord to new heights. Safe, pleasant, special. Maybe that's why Bethel was such a special place. But these are words that also should describe our Bethel. And then, very closely related to that, Bethel was a place of return. Right. Back to Bethel is a phrase frequently used in Genesis, where Abraham went back to Bethel. Jacob went back to Bethel. It was their home base. After they went from Ur, they went to, Eth to Bethel. After Abraham went to Egypt, he came back to Bethel. After Jacob was running for his life, he went back to Bethel. It was their home base. Yeah, right. It was a place where they recentered. It was a place where God pressed a reset button on their life when they went back to Bethel. And that's what a Sunday morning worship service does for me. We all need refreshment in our lives. We all need revival in our lives. We all need reconnecting in our lives. And, and, and for some reason, Christians are like logs on a fireplace. Have you ever noticed logs on a fireplace? Many logs on a fireplace will burn brightly. But if one rolls off to the side, away from the other logs, for some reason, it quickly grows cold. One log, unless it's one of those Duraflame logs that's full of wax and gasoline, a regular log won't burn by itself individually. But for some reason, five or six logs together burn brightly. And it's like that with Christians. Together, we stay stirred up. We stay fired up for the Lord. But if I roll off to myself individually and solitary, I quickly grow cold in my Christian faith. And, um, and, uh, and so Bethel was that place of refreshment, of revival, of reconnecting. And, and our Bethel needs to be that place that no matter how far you've strayed, no matter how addled you've become, no matter how distraught you are, 
Bethel, we come to Bethel and it shows us that our sure foundation and our center is always to come back to the Lord. Folks, God has never moved. Right. So, so if, if you don't feel as close to God as you once did, it's not God who moved. Um, he is our true Bethel, really, not the church building. But when we come, when I'm with other Christians, man, that fire grows brighter. So Bethel is a place of redemption. Bethel is a place of rest. Bethel is a place of return and revival and refreshment and reconnecting. Bethel is also a place... Of relationship. Right. Yeah. All right. Abraham called on the name of the Lord here at Bethel. Now that's uh, interesting in the Old Testament because you don't see as much personal relationship with God in the Old Testament as you do the New Testament. You see people following the law of God. But especially in Genesis, you see people that had personal relationships with God. In fact, yeah. one of Abraham's titles was the friend of God. And, uh, and so... Bethel was a place of relationship. This is where Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Right. Now again, you can call on God any time. You can call on God any place. But at our Bethel here, it's a place again where we've, we've built a system that provides a nurturing system, a mechanism where you can respond to God. We have the service, we have the music, the teaching, the worship. We have crowds of people. We're praying together. We're supporting people. But even though we've put everything in place for you to be saved, it's still up to you. Yeah, right. You know, God's done everything for you to be saved. He created you in His own image. He speaks to you in His Word. He supplied the grace. He supplied the faith. He went to the cross. He rose from the grave. He's done everything for you to be saved. Here at Bethel Baptist Church, we've done everything for you to be saved. But listen, the choice is still up to you. Right. That's right. The one thing we can't do, your mama can't do it for you. Your daddy can't do it. Your granddaddy, who was a Baptist preacher, can't do it for you. Right. Your preacher can't do it for you. This is the one to say, kids, it's amazing. Even a fourth or fifth grader or a second grader, this is the first thing that your parents can't do for you. This is the first thing in your life that they can't make you do. This is the first real decision that you have in your life. And in some ways, it's the first and most important decision. Your parents, can, man, they tell you to do everything. When to get up, when to go to school, what to wear, when to study, when to do your homework, when to go to bed. This is one thing your parents can't do for you. We've done everything for you to be saved. God's done everything for you to be saved. But it's still up to you to finally take that step of faith. Right. And make that decision. And the choice is up to you. In a minute, here at the back, as people are leaving, I want to talk to some of you about how to do that. You're here, you might be 20, 30, 50 years old, 90 years old. And you've been living your own life, making your own decisions, living your life in your own ingenuity, in your own creativity. But you're ready now to give your life to the Creator. And like Abraham, you're ready for this to be your Bethel and for you to call on the name of the Lord. Right. We'll pray with you. We'll help you to know Christ. Listen, some of you who know that uh, you're not going to go to heaven when you die or you're not sure, you'll be sure after we meet with you in the back right. of the church here. Um, some of you need more information about baptism. And church membership. Oh, you're saved. You remember that time when you prayed to receive Christ, but you haven't taken that next step. And you've been living life in disobedience to the Lord. And we'll talk with you about that next step, baptism, church membership. Some of you need to join. Some of you have a prayer request. Any other need that you have, we want to pray with you. Susan will be there as well. Ray, some of our other church leaders. We want to pray with you. And we want this to be your Bethel where you feel like setting up a rock here and saying, this is a pillar. This is where I met the Lord. Or some of you who are already Christians, man, this is where I met the Lord in a special way. This is where God changed my direction. This is where He supplied my needs. Let this be your Bethel today. Again, in, now in today's world, Bethel isn't really a place. It's a relationship. That's right. God is your Bethel. He is your house. He is your foundation. He is your shepherd. But even saying all that, the choice is still yours. God is a gentleman. He stands at the door of your heart and knocks. Revelation 3.20. Sir, ma'am, young person, here's what the verse says. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. 
Notice, Jesus didn't bust his way into your life. He's a gentleman. He stands at the door of your heart. Sir, ma'am, young person, let me come in. Let me share my life with you. Right. But he doesn't bust his way in. He waits until you open the door. Will you open the door of your heart to Christ today? Well, how do you do that? You do it through prayer. Right. And prayer is simply talking to God. <clears throat> and you just need to say, Lord, I open the door of my life. I receive you into my life. Take control of my life. Forgive me of my sins. Thank you for shedding your blood for me on the cross. Now help me always to live for you. It's a simple little prayer that a lot of us have prayed, but some of you haven't. But this can be your Bethel today if you do it.